Did we do well, my darling girls? Did we really do well? We grew you up to be straight and strong, to do your best to know right from wrong. But we grew you in this awful world, a world that's hard and tough for girls. And part of your strength was to take it, to take it and make it okay. But it's not okay, my darling girls, in this fucked up, muddled up, mixed up world. So, good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you. As you know, we're here for our fortnightly object webinar, object in our object campaigns on five links, all to do with the objectification of women. Uh, we campaign on pornography, prostitution, surrogacy, transgenderism, uh, and uh, sex clubs. And um, the links between them, because if you just campaign on one, unfortunately, all the hate seems to go somewhere else. This week, we've been working on surrogacy and we found out something slightly surprising. Surrogacy UK, the main pro-surrogacy not-for-profit in the UK, acts as if it's a charity, seeking volunteers, fundraisers, asking people to donate the raffle prizes. But actually, if you look at it, it's a private company with assets of £80,000. We'll be having a blog post on this coming out soon. Our quote of the day is from Gavin De Becker, uh, who wrote The Gift of Fear. He says, men are afraid that women will laugh at them. Women are afraid that men will kill them, which says a lot about how safe one half of the population is from the other. And our website link of the day is to an article by Caroline Franson, a Dutch therapist, who looks into what family and even family history issues might induce a person to want to change their sex. And she says everyone should look at these issues before going down the trans road. Uh, you'll find in the chat a reading list if you want to read more about men and boys. There are quite a few good books on the subject. And of course, we have an expert here today with us in the form of Michael Conroy from Men at Work. So today, the female gaze falls on Michael. He's a former teacher who runs a community interest training company called, after the band, Men at Work. <laughs> they train boys and men to move away from their socially conditioned sexism, misogyny and rape uh, culture, and to teach them to respect women and girls as human beings, which is revolutionary. But Michael, welcome and thanks very much for joining us today. Um, uh, yeah, good afternoon. When we work long and hard at men, we tend to see, first of all, perpetrators of violence and exploitation against us. Often we recognise it, but find it all too much. We avert our eyes and seek refuge in denial and distraction until the violence comes our way, and then we often suffer mental, physical and or emotional collapse or long-term damage. After the perpetrators, we see the namouts, the not all men are like that people, the self-righteous, complacent ones who may still believe in and operate bros before hoes, but they say that they personally are not hurting anyone. They're still, nevertheless, taking quiet advantage, not just of the sexual exploitation systems, poor and prostitution and so on, but of all of the systems in society that favor men. Oh, sorry, my male cat's just walked out of the room. I think he's taking offense. Um, pretty obvious, I think. Finally, we see the third group, the rare men who actually do something about it. Um, and men like you, Michael. We may resent the fact that you earn your living from our victimhood and distress, but on balance, we want your work to be effective and we want men's behaviour to change, to change a lot, to change soon. So, Michael, would you like to tell us a little bit about your organisation? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, for inviting me. I'm really uh, honoured. And um, I hope I can um, answer the questions properly. Um, the organisation, I, I set it up two years ago, approximately, um, to respond to what I saw as a real gap in the, certainly the English education system that I've been working in for 16, nearly 17 years now, uh, secondary mainly. Um, it, the, the gap is the, the work that should be being done to address uh, misogyny 
as it is being formed and solidified in the minds of young men. But that work simply doesn't happen in a strategic or a programmatic way. There may well be good ad hoc stuff happening here and there uh, around the country. I wouldn't, I wouldn't I presume to think that only I have kind of uh, decided to engage in this kind of thing. But I, I, there are not many um, deep programs that are based on collaborative uh, respectful sessions with boys and young men that are that are more than a one-off uh, and I think a one-off is not good enough uh, we need to have time and resources and be very purposeful and intentional in developing um, critical thinking understanding about the messages with which boys and young men are uh, bombarded from from birth or perhaps even from before birth if we start thinking about gender and and the decisions that parents make about you know what color to paint the room and what kind of toys to buy the baby and all that kind of stuff so so I work in the English Midlands and the West Midlands mainly uh, although I do work uh, further afield certainly now with the whole zoom <laughs> webinar explosion I can work wherever uh, I'm invited to, um, but every week for some years now, for five or six years now, I've I've run small groups of um, six, seven, eight teenage boys in several schools at the same time, and and we have deep conversations um, around what it means to be a man, what what expectations are put on us, what privileges we're given, what um, what are the boundaries, uh, when is a choice that we make something which veers dangerously towards being perceived as feminine and, and, and the punishments that come from that, but also the, the, um, the unearned privilege that, that we enjoy. So, so that's what I do. Uh, and right. I, I, I want to do it until there is no more need to do it, which I, I, I fear I might out work anytime soon. <laughs> no, sadly not. Sadly not. But I, I would like to because I would quite like to do gardening more. <laughs> uh, but I, it, it's work that I enjoy and it's, re it's really rewarding. But um, tragically, it is um, not something that is widely done. And I think That's that is shame, something it? that it, I, it really I've is. I've not heard of anybody else that does it, but I particularly wanted to pick up on your point about it's important to do deep and continuing work with people because mm. if you give people a short one-off the message is this is not important this is this yeah. is marginal at best you can forget yeah. about this quite safely we clearly don't really mean all this we're just ticking a box and yeah. you know, don't even really bother to engage whereas i would imagine that some of the young men you talk to may not have that many other older men in their lives helping and guiding them and it could mean an awful lot to them to have somebody like you to talk to and also in a group to have each other to talk to as well because you know it, it's there's, there's that, that power in a group isn't there but, you know Absolutely. you have a group session and then you realize when you, you meet the group again that they've all been talking to each other over the week so it's not like there's been no input and they've been kicking it around pulling it apart and they come back with questions next time which means they've really thought about it because they've yeah. talked to each other about it absolutely absolutely and being and over the space of a week may have been in a position similar to a theoretical one that we've discussed like what would you do if so yes. you're, you're, at a party, you're at a party and you see your mate leading a girl into a room and she's clearly drunk or whatever it might be yeah, yeah, or yeah. you're walking down we, we do lots of that like what would you do if so it's kind of theoretical you're walking down the street behind a woman um do you, what do you think is going through her mind? Would you be concerned if you thought she was worried about you? Would you would you be offended? If so, why? So we kind of we 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 do a lot of theoretical stuff. And luckily, well, like you say theoretical, but when you say you're asking a boy a question, what's in her mind? You're actually teaching him empathy. You're teaching him to look at her situation and try and imagine from what he knows what her train of thought might be. Now that is yeah. empathy. That is putting yourselves in somebody else's shoes, and it's something that, in my view, boys are not sufficiently encouraged to do. And it's a, you know, it's, it's a big part of getting them to change their behaviour. Um, I, I agree. I agree that we 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 are not taught from birth to be empathetic in ways that, that in ways that girls and women are well, girls uh, are taught. Absolutely, and they they tend to see older women as carers. I remember when my son was at school, he um 
he fell over and hurt himself once and somebody came and you know I was told later and um, I said well there you are you know now don't you if you see somebody crying in the playground you know what to do to help them and people started yeah. coming up to me saying what a wonderful son I had and how special mm -hmm. he was because he's helped there all it was was one sentence all it was was a push in the right direction yeah yeah and you know, boys don't get that little little push. You know, once you've done that, you, you've got something to acknowledge and to build on. Sure, and I, absolutely. Um, and and to to acknowledge those kind of early messages that that we are um, either given or not given. We we look at things like messages on birthday cards, um, toys. Um, we you know we look at toy websites sometimes. Uh, the conversation is very open-ended, but the objectives are to look carefully at how we are built collectively, um, not as not as physical beings. That, that that's a given. We are who we are physically, and, and uh, but beyond that, we are the, the sum of the messages to which we're exposed, and and the decisions we make about how we respond to that. And, and there are so many influences, as you say, you know, um, parents, carers, siblings, um, all form of media, media from the pictures on the wall in the room that you grow up in to what you see out of the window to adverts to porn to T-shirt messages, just everything. So it's, it's, it's about developing the skills to understand, to recognise that just everythingness. And, and hopefully develop a, a, a lens through which to see human interaction and you know the the hierarchical system in which we live and and to be able therefore to kind of unpick it and to and to delegitimize it uh, where it is harmful mm, which is teaching a lot of very useful analytical skills as well isn't it hopefully yeah, yeah. hopefully how do you find trainers and what sort of trainers do you like to work with I think the very best um, use of, of my time is to train teachers or youth workers or mentors, maybe in sports or wh wherever somebody has prolonged um, capacity to build relationships with boys and young men, to train them in that, in that way of seeing, in, in that kind of critical way of seeing and about understanding our own subjectivity within the process as men um whatever age we are you know early 20s 40s 50s i'm 53 so i kind of um come to this really quite late which i regret um but i th i th I, I am rarely uh i rarely find teachers youth workers mentors who don't want to do a good job or who don't have the uh, young people's best interests at heart mm -hmm. of course you know professions are enormous if you've got half a million people in a profession some will be um very you know they will vary hugely in that but most of the colleagues that i come across want to do well are very heavily overworked have huge burdens on them on their time and expectations but um i th i think a, a re, ima being imaginative enough and being um, yeah imaginative enough to see the point of this work is really important and when you find people who definitely see the point really quickly because they're aware of the issues and do, but perhaps see them as kind of a layer of layers and layers of unrelated issues you know behavior whether you know whatever in school in high school you're going to be talking about things like uh, bullying, dick pics, um, um, the whole gamut of, of teenage uh, in negative behaviours. Um, and so they know that, they know these things because they're having to deal with them, but it's, it's dealing with them as, in a holistic way is perhaps what's missing. And, and so it's always a real pleasure when you meet people, and I've been meeting a lot recently, either online or, or in person, um, who get it and instantly see that it's an opportunity to address lots of issues at the same time by looking, uh, look unraveling the, the, the social messaging that, to which 
boys and teenage boys, adolescents and young men are exposed. Um, and that process is something that I think is something they take away in a in a toolkit and hopefully, you know, they use it in their own lives as well, because this the work has has to affect the facilitator as well, because um, we're not transmitting things, you know, uh, in a hyper hypodermic uh, needle. And we we are not involved because we we are as men's facilitators, you know, very much involved because this is the world that we grew up in as well. Although it is, of course, accelerating in different ways, uh, thanks to the internet, um, which is a questions, actually, yeah, a couple of questions uh, on what you said already. Uh, Sue Gittins is asking, is there a government education strategy for this kind of education? No, no, we're not really talking about was it was what's that? No, kind there of, isn't. They do citizenship and all that stuff. Um, um, there, there, there is. Uh, there was a new. Uh, relationship, sex education, and health uh, framework from the DF from the Department of Education yeah. that that was penciled in to be launched in September 20. Now, obviously, COVID can, um, has delayed and to some extent derailed that. And and, and there there is a, a welcome uh, mention and focus of schools' responsibility to address. Uh, misogyny but as it, it's a recommendation and there is no uh body of resources attached to that there no is really done it properly no I, th I think the phrase is a school should be alive to uh the potential and and reality of misogyny and homophobia and sexism so it's just yet another demand that's been put on schools without any real help for them to, to yeah offer. yeah Effectively, it, it's saying you will be judged on this, and yet there is no. And here's the here's the stuff you need to do it with, um, which is an interesting <laughs> approach to something which is so important. But of course, it, it's free; it doesn't cost the government anything to say that. Yeah. Uh, and and it's not bad that they say it. It's just that it's not connected to a real world strategy. Um, and then. There are, you know, I'm talking about English education system, which I know more than than others. Although, you know, there are some slight changes in the devolved nations. Um, the, there are citizenship PSHE sessions where people may talk uh, from um, a range of subjects which they are expected to have covered by the time that young people leave leave um, compulsory education. But again, that's very, very broad, and it might well be, for example, something like prostitution, for example, is not specifically uh, mentioned. It would be tagged on to a discussion of human trafficking. And when you really boil it down, you think, how long is a young person going to be involved in a critical conversation around prostitution, for example? And you work out it's about 20 minutes in their entire school career. Now, it, it, it's no, <laughs> very, very far from that. L likewise, notions of coercive control are not really mentioned um, unless somebody chooses to do criminology A level, in which case that will, it does feature, but that's a vanishingly small number of, of young people. Mm -hmm. so, so there is no systematic programme nationally in the UK, certainly not in England that I'm aware of, well there isn't, uh, uh, based on uh, evidence-based approach to uh, understanding the root cause of misogyny. It, it doesn't exist um, and that and that is outrageous and shameful and danger. uh, dangerous, it's, it's yeah. a danger. Like, we're, yeah. we're allowing our culture and all the hate in our culture to lead these boys down the primrose path about thinking, yeah, I'm turning into a man, I'm ticking all the boxes. And actually a lot of them ends up in prison and, and it, in, in failed relationships and in all sorts of the mess. So it, it is, it is a mm. absolute uh, tragedy, as you say. I've got uh, one or two ex-teachers, I think, listening, and there's a, some very practical questions in here. Um, how do you, do you respond to boys in early puberty who make remarks about um, the onset of periods for girls in their class? How do you deal with the periods issue? Um, I, my group's are single sex only, 
I, I only deal with boys. Um, but the boys might still talk about the girls. And oh yeah, no, no, absolutely, yeah, sure. So, so, so I, I, it wouldn't, it wouldn't happen that they were doing it in, in during a session in a mix, mix group. Sorry, I just want to clarify that. Uh, oh yeah, we, we talk about, we talk about periods. We talk about, um, we talk uh, often. That conversation is about blood and at men's reactions to blood in TV and show and films and uh, games, video games, you know, whatever they're playing, Call of Duty, Fortnite, um, GTA, Grand Theft Auto, whatever games they play and whatever films they watch, often they, they've watched some really horrific, they watch horror films that I wouldn't even spend yeah. a second on they just get get <laughs> i'm not very good with that with that kind of thing. i get nightmares and it that it bothers me that of course you know 10 11 12 year old boys will have seen films involving you know dismemberment slaughter massacre whatever it is of another kind isn't it yeah yeah uh, yeah yeah it's uh, and and therefore that that's um that's one way in that we've started talking about about um men's Re repulsion at, at menstrual blood when really we celebrate bloodletting and and forms of entertainment in, in which blood is is featured so that's that's kind of an interesting way into that conversation um but often sometimes you just have to just state basic biological reality because well they may not know they don't they don't know you know a lot of the lads that i've spoken to simply don't know they just they it's something that they can't focus on because they find they're squeamish or they they find it um or, uh, distasteful or, or whatever it may be but there's certainly a, a gap of ignorance and that is something that we just talk through it i, I just go online if, if we've got the facilities to go online and say let's let's spend 10 minutes so that at the end of this you know damn well what the theory it is yeah. and and end the story uh and why the hell you don't know that already is a question i can't really answer uh because their skills haven't haven't done that it may be that they they weren't listening or they mentally shut down during a, a class i mean that happens of course but yeah we do talk ab about there's nothing that i i personally don't um want to or will not talk about in very matter of fact way um and that's a shame. Again, that speaks to the way that we expect teachers in schools to deliver PSAG sessions. And they've got very, very little training, hardly any subject specialists, yeah. which which I think shocks some people when they realise that most PSE, PSHE, RSE sessions are delivered by job, geography teachers, maths teachers, English teachers, PE teachers. Yeah. And of course, they're anybody, anybody. very anxious about delivering it and their anxiety comes across. It leaks yeah, out yeah. and the kids get the idea that these topics are teachers that, you know, the, the, the teacher's not comfortable with, so they won't come out with their questions and they will pick up on that anxiety and feel that anxiety themselves in, in looking at these topics. Absolutely, uh, yeah. I mean, what, what one can only imagine some of the the uh, car crash situations that have, have arisen across you know across thousands and thousands of classrooms for years and years because it's not seen as a that pshe specialism is is all is like hen's teeth it really is super it's outrageous and then people are asked or asked or sometimes volunteer to do pshe sessions but they they personally as you say I'm not sure of their own opinions on some subjects. Oh, yeah. I'm not, I'm, I'm not, you know, they might be asked to talk about porn and, and might be porn users, might be yeah. pro porn, might be pro prostitution, yeah. might be utterly terrified and not sleep the night before thinking, what the hell am I going to stay? Yeah. They're going to eat me alive. And, and, and you know, the whole, yeah, the whole gamut of, of yeah. things which comes when we don't, as, an, as a culture, take this seriously. In a dispassion, yeah, we banish them to the margins. Yeah, absolutely, and I and and that's how uh, you know I, I I and others have seen in the last four or five years total kind of carpet bagger uh, quack providers of PSHE that are, oh. you know things things that if if a hundred people sat down and, and and read through them you know ninety nine would say what the hell is this why are our kids being exposed to this clearly 
you know, pro porn, pro prostitution gibberish. Um, and, and that's partly because of the academization of English schools where local authorities are not yeah. the central yeah. hub for disseminating um, resources and support or, or for commissioning uh, external speakers. Each school, if you're an academy, you're basically on your own and you've got your own decision-making capacity. Uh, and that comes with some with with many downsides. So a lot of reinventing of the wheel, then even if something good happened, all the schools yeah. would reinvent it. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. there's a huge, huge amount of waste, huge amount of, of repetition, but also um, it, they're easy to pick off. But you know, for gr groups, who, um, lobby groups who are well funded and yeah. they present really nice material, nice looking materials, and nobody wants to say. Nobody has the time, perhaps, or the the critical capacity to look at it and say, actually, we find there are some ethical issues here. And then once somebody gets established in one school, there's a recommendation and boom, boom, boom. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, we got a position where I think it was in Warwickshire uh, two yeah. years ago. Yes, there right. was some, yes. There's some materials there. They were just uh, basically uh, just in, endorsing anything. And uh, you know, I, I don't really even and want to give them. They had to them. There was absolutely because once uh, a sufficient number of rational adults see it, there is no defence for it. But the problem is that it exists and it flourishes where that critical glare does not exist, and where people feel awkward or they don't want to be seen as a fuddy duddy or as a you know sex negative or whatever the yeah, hell that's the old fashioned or you know not one yeah. yeah absolutely yeah. and that's the pimp the pimp uh pimp, pimp and, yeah, uh, and pop, yeah. yeah it's, it's, the, it's their dream yeah, yeah absolutely and and also i think there's another aspect of that delivery of pshe which is interesting is that you know young women teachers who may be kind of um of the liberal um third wave sort of persuasion and feel under pressure not to be vanilla and all of that that comes with that. And therefore that, that's another group of people who will not apply a critical lens. Um, and that's a problem, that's, that's a fight to, to have and, and it's one that is being had, obviously. Um, so I would, I would say, sorry for rambling, but I, I think in terms of um, Delivery of really important sex ed, but also broader than that, talking about uh, relationships and control and power and um, what is reasonable to expect from partner, whether it's uh, opposite sex or same sex, is just not thoroughly addressed um, by by the nation. It's it, it, it's it's fractured. It's uh, decentralised and it. Is, it needs a way out for people with an agenda which is not the agenda about what's best for the children. Absolutely. No, absolutely that. Um, I've and got that, a couple of questions that, coming up. I'm getting quite a list here. Um, Irina says, does Michael have daughters or girls in his family and what sort of things do the boys and men come out with? So, do you want to tell them about your family? Yeah, I've got a daughter. She's 16. I've got a son who's 14. Um, um, and I don't know, I don't know, I know it's corny and I know it's it's something that people don't want to hear, but I don't know if I'd be involved in this if I hadn't had kids. And I, I know that that pisses a lot of people off and I understand why it does. Um, but I, I, it, um, hmm, I, it does help to, as my daughter has been growing, and my son, you know, both, you, I have started to see the world through their eyes, in a sense, in a way that I would never have thought about. Going to birthday parties, seeing the kinds of gifts that people give, seeing that, hearing the comments that parents have about their sons or their daughters, and all the kind of separations, and the and and just the stereotypes being iterated and reiterated, mm. that. That was a process that I couldn't have bought or trained to do. And, and I 
feel that it has given me more knowledge than I, I would have had. Uh, having said that, I understand that when people say, I'm interested in this because I've got a daughter, I, I get that it is, it ain't good enough. You have to be interested because women are human beings. I, I get that. Yeah. Uh, but I but I also have a daughter and I don't know whether I would have got that if I hadn't had so, to be fair. And actually me. men can be human beings too with a bit of a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. No, that that's my starting premise. <laughs> is that is is that anything which assumes uh kind of the bestiality of, of men is uh, is something I absolutely reject, which is why I, I, I don't want to give them too much airtime. Uh, I was engaging with Fathers for Justice this morning. Oh, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it, <laughs> they, they were tweeting a, a demand. Firstly, they were saying that Ryan Giggs was a, a victim of a political conspiracy. So obviously, it's subdued to say, but I don't, I won't say any more. But to, to, to suggest that is, is interesting to say the least. But they were also demanding that uh, a campaign by Plan UK. Um, oh, yeah which was about street harassment of school girls by adult men on the way to school to and from and how they had to change their route. They were saying that that was pure misandry and uh, should be abandoned immediately and, and it would make men kill themselves. So as somebody who's actually trained in suicide prevention and, and mental health uh, and mental health instructor for teachers, the idea, and I'm a man, and you know the idea that a, a man being told that men harass schoolgirls is so bad for my mental health that I might consider killing myself is misandry. That that is misandry, and the, and the main misandry I've always ever seen comes from men who seem to loathe us ourselves and and that baffles me it, it well, you baffles know, men, me. But if, you, if you think men are human beings so i was very careful at the beginning to say that this is socialized behavior yeah then yeah. you know that men should be held accountable for their behavior just like anybody else's just like women are and they should be accountable for harassing girls and they should be taught not to um, and, and the idea to say that it's like saying of a child you know oh if i stop my child doing this i'll give them problems later your child needs to learn how to behave if your child's mm. going to function in the world your child needs to know how to be a part of a group, to listen to the teacher, and to be considerate of fellow group members. And that is the best starting life you can give your child because then your child has got a platform for success. And once you start going down the route of, oh, it's going to upset my child if I stop them doing X, Y, and Z, you are on the, on the way to derailing your child for having success. Yeah, life. absolutely. I mean, if we, accountability is a key part of you know, civilized okay. life and yeah. maturity and, and development. And every, Every the the other question I think what what your, your question was the second part was what do I talk to the boys about? Yeah, what sort of things do the boys and men come out with? Well, it's the boys, isn't it? Do all all kinds. Surprise you? What do they come out with? Uh, all kinds of everything in no particular order. Something I'm 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 encountering a lot recently is is a lot of total kind of. Uh, mm, they, they believe in the myths of the porn industry, hook, line, and yeah, sinker. Yeah. Some, some, some do. I mean, some don't. Some don't look at porn. I mean, yeah, I, I, they arrive in the group for a variety of reasons, which maybe, maybe I can talk about later. But um, I was talking about OnlyFans the other day. You know, this thing that's cropped up in the last couple of years. There's an English guy who's made two billion quid out of it and it's like a giant ponzi scheme basically but there are some high profile um um i think uh, actors are the actors I'm, I'm not sure if they're they're in from porn or they were or actors otherwise but who have ostentatiously made a lot of money but they were people with two three million followers already so when they flipped to only fans of course they're going to take those fans with them and they make they can make huge amounts of money. But that is, as with prostitution and, and porn generally, the, t the thin end of a, of a very different pyramid or ice, you know, tip of an iceberg, which is very different. Uh, so, that, so they are easily persuaded of the mythology of people only do porn if, because they want to. Uh, you, why would you be a prostitute if you didn't like it? You can get a different kind of job. You know that 
uncritical acceptance of things which are put to them. Yes. Uh, and those are conversations that we have about getting to getting to the facts of it really and um and and asking the question why do we want to believe comforting myths um you know i wouldn't i wouldn't necessarily launch into that at the first time i ever met anybody but i would notice i would note that they'd said it and then come around maybe a couple of two or three weeks later and say you yeah. were you were saying that the other week and 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 now we've got this thing that we're talking about and it's connected to that. So you do have to listen really intently and not necessarily um, jump on every single thing there and then at that time because you've got a pro. That's the beauty of having a program and a regular meeting that you can um, not ignore it, but, but, but schedule it. And, and know that you've got some resources that you don't have with you there and then that you can bring and you can start a conversation in which that will take its natural place and, and the lads will see the point of it rather than saying, I've got a list of 10 things and I need to tell you them all, regardless of your mood or the dynamic in the room, I'm going to do it because that's on my list. Uh, that's not how I it's personally... It's one direction communication, isn't it, which a lot of people are yeah. likely to switch off from. Absolutely. It, it, yeah. yeah. It's, it, it's, 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 there's a time and a place for lectures, um, and I think this isn't it no. at all. So I think, you know, you need to know where the fire exits are, and that's just one-way communication. Get it. But yeah. when you want to draw from young young men the extent to which they've been socialized and the uh, reason in their use to sustain it or the conflicts that they might be in uh, i think you've just got to listen and find out who, who they are and why why and how and what <laughs> and, and, why, and should they, why should they trust you if you're not even interested enough to listen to what they say you know in fact somebody's absolutely. asked how do you get the boys to actually care about the subjects that you teach and i think maybe we partly answered that already by saying it's not just teaching is it? it's not just presentation it's part of it is picking up on what they bring but would you have to say any more about that how do you get the boys to care about the subjects i think um not coming across as judgmental because I, I, mm, it's a tricky one and some of my sentences don't come across as particularly clear but i hope i can get the point across is that one has to see oneself as as part of them because we are and we we are born on the same planet uh, and we've got so much in common and our lives have uh, been a combination of social influence decisions learning making mistakes uh regret the whole the whole human story and if we take that genuinely to a group of boys and young men and see yourself as somebody who's done a lot of thinking and reading and listening yeah but also somebody who's made a lot of mistakes and been vulnerable and been fearful uh or, and uh exposed to dynamics of male groups whatever they may be either professionally or as in peer groups i think if you just go with authenticity you will get authenticity in most cases. Um, and yeah, I think if you it's really got... important what you said about it's it's not you and, and me, it's us, isn't it? Us men. Yeah, absolutely. Get the process done to you. And I think absolutely. it's about sharing vulnerabilities. I think that's something that's very hard for men to do, isn't it? You know, usually if a man's going to share his vulnerabilities, it'll be with a woman because she doesn't really matter. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Sharing yeah, vulnerabilities yeah. with each other. That's very yeah. powerful. Of course, you're role modeling when you do that, aren't you? your role modeling that it's possible for men to do that and retain their dignity and retain their self-esteem and not get laughed at yeah. because they're probably not going to yeah. get laughed and if they do laugh at you you ain't going to care because you know it's important to do it yeah 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 and, and often if there is any kind of laughter then it would be it, it, it's fear speaking it's just a, a different yes. voice yeah. fear. or it's discomfort and, and crossing over yeah. a yeah. that might absolutely no I, I, absolutely i i, I think authenticity and and really okay i think i've got to go beyond off, off it. I'm just being honest as honest as you can be um but always bearing in mind you know this isn't a, this isn't an opportunity for
for us to for us to tell our life story to a captive audience you know they're not our therapy group um we uh, we have to be completely uh, aware of safeguarding and you know keeping the young men safe and you know very clear ground rules and we've got a list of about eight or nine sometimes they add them so you know it's about you know what what is said in the room is respected uh, and we take we we share the air nobody dominates but, you know pro-social modeling within the group um i mean but some are more reticent than others and that may last the program of eight or ten weeks but you might see a sudden shift because they suddenly feel able to speak about something uh or some who may start very vocal may go very quiet and and there are reasons for that um but there's always a lot going on in their own lives which is why really close communication with the staff in the school is important and that's one of the the things that I'm not keen on the external speakers who get parachuted in for an hour yeah. do an assembly for 200 kids and, and and hope that by the power of their charisma they will have kind of affected some kind of um, you know epiphany it can happen it can I've met some people for a very short length of time and really been struck by what they've said but I would say that's something of an exception and it's not a particularly good mod. I mean, they are not also that those those groups often charge quite a lot of money. And you think that that's a that's an extraction of assets from that school. Well, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. When you could be you could be spending that time and that money training four, five, six, eight teachers who are going to stay in that school and have relationships with the boys and young men all the time and, and know them in all kinds of contexts and and be able to keep repeating the themes of the conversation and expanding on them or going, oh, um, or, or harking back to a conversation that was had for a year a year earlier. And, and this kind of constant peripatetic um, dropping in of people who who just extract value from the school i i, I think it's um you know unethical yeah it's and, and not the best way to spend the money that's that's definitely is there no, anything I, for girls do you know that to what you do for boys um i i know of a few people who do really good stuff it, but it, it, in small ways because it's so hard to get funding for this kind of stuff i know as a, a woman called uh Gemma, uh Aitchison, who, oh, uh, yeah. who's yet Yes, Matt is UK. She she does work with um, girls main, I think, in in Greater Manchester. Uh, and my mind's blank. There are, there will be others, but it's that. Uh, it's, Fiona Broadfoot it, does something, doesn't she? Her build a girl project. Fiona Broadfoot. Who's that? Sorry. Fiona Broadfoot. Fiona, Fiona Broadfoot, I believe so. Yeah, in in West Yorkshire, that yeah, is that's it, yeah. in the northwest. There will no doubt be loads of really good stuff but we're all battling the same thing which is there is no national coordinated strategy or political will yeah. um and that's a problem uh, because preventative work is really difficult to obtain funding for because a politician an mp won't be able to stand on the floor of the house of commons and say there's been a 3.6 reduction percent reduction of x because you're dealing with an unknown outcome in a sense because you're trying to prevent yes. things from happening yes <laughs> um and therefore it's difficult to quantify so you do rely on qualitative um anecdotal feedback from schools or youth centers or wherever it is where they they can comment on an outcome of individuals but that is very difficult to persuade on a national level and that's a shame because um some things some things which are easy to quantifiably um uh, report on are not necessarily so impactful yeah yeah can i um ask you what uh, sort of thing you do teach boys about the sex trade porn prostitution and, and um you know lap dancing clubs sort of things yeah um it's uh it's entirely critical um no gray areas uh, it's we talk about uh poverty 
we talk about um, the the route from care. But lots lots of young women and young men actually yeah, end up in, yeah, in right, prostitution yeah, and right, sex work. Yeah. Um, have been in care or have been abused as kids. There's this you know a wealth of, of statistical evidence about that. I go online and find newspaper reports. Not not uh, I try and find things that are mainstream. Uh, therefore, it doesn't seem like I'm just kind of crowbarring in kind of minority views. But yeah. you know, there there is very easily accessible facts about about such as you know the link the child care um, having been in care. You know, it's a kind of a pipeline uh, for prostitution in some cases. Uh, we talk about uh, who really makes the money. That's that's a difficult one because I think it's a defence mechanism that boys who are starting to watch porn, they want it to be true that the, that everybody's happy and they want it to be true that people have chosen it as a career just like any other career. And it's problematic and painful to have to ponder uh, that that isn't the case. In, in the overwhelming vast majority of, of, of cases, uh, and, and so it's basically, um, I say, no, I, what you're saying, I don't believe is the case, and, I, and there is evidence to suggest uh, that it isn't the case. Now, let's ask, before we look at it, let's ask yourself why you would want it to be the case, and that's kind of a philosophical approach to it. Um, Obviously, the responses are going to uh, are different every time because you know everybody's an individual. But it, the commonality of themes is really interesting. Is that I've noticed recently, lots of young boys being absolutely sure that lots of uh, even the, the use of the word porn star is is weird. You know, I'd, I'd say, why are you using the word porn star like, when you wouldn't? You're talking to anybody in porn is a porn star, so you've kind of bought into a myth in a sense that it's a glamorous life, whereas somebody who's just an extra on Coronation Street wouldn't call them a TV star. You know, like, yeah. just, just yeah. trying to unpick everything, I'm just constantly asking why. Um, I know that there's a certain trend in education to say that why is a difficult question. And I'm thinking, I get it in some cases, like, why did you do that? I know that. Because we're not why you did something, yeah. No. But, but but why per se is a really important and powerful question because it's about getting to the the root of um, why we think what we think. And I think that's really important is being able to know why we think what we think. It's really empowering. It's, it's liberating. Um, so that's one of my... I don't have a punitive or corrective um, basis for what I do at all. I, I It's... Uh, exploratory, it's um, you know egalitarian. Um, it we, we're all equals in the room, apart from you know I, I'm a, as an adult, I, I know that I have to maintain boundaries and have to be aware of safeguarding. You know, I'm not I'm not some kind of multi multi coloured head rainbow uh, unicornist <laughs> at all <laughs> at all. Uh, uh, oh, there's nothing wrong with having multi coloured hair. <laughs> um, as I was growing up, lots and lots of elderly ladies in Bolton had blue and pink. Uh, it was, it was, just, uh, but um, a lot of young people wouldn't believe that. Um, yeah, so so it's pragmatic. We talk about um, porn and prostitution in terms of objectification, and there's a. I've got a book that I use a manual that I've written called Ten Dialogues, which is a free dialogue, uh, a free download off my website it's, it's oh, no, let me just stop it, because somebody's asked you about that so, yeah marina font she'd like to know if as a parent she could ask her daughter's school to share the curriculum well you know you can look on michael's website uh, and find his yeah. dialogues and download those for free anytime absolutely absolutely use them chop them up change them and if you've, got, if you've got children grandchildren at schools in the area and you think that the boys in that school need a bit of education download get somebody in absolutely. there absolutely it's it's free for everybody it's it's not carved in granite it is um it, it's the fruit of several years work so it's all been practiced and done and i i try to give fairly detailed sort of lesson plan well session plan for the facilitator down to things like they might say this they might answer this if they do try that uh, it's just kind of a lived in document broadly speaking it's a 10 hour program which which is in the scheme of things only 10 hours 
but it's also in the same scheme of things in which that's 10 hours more than would have happened otherwise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it's intended as a contribution to a collective effort to raise um, really important issues in, in a serious and steady way over time, rather than it just being a hurried bolt on by somebody who might be, I think the phrase is bricking it, to deliver a session that they're not they're not trained to well, do or this is their anxiety and confusion which makes actually absolutely. matters worse doesn't it absolutely and that that is uh, not a good use of professional time <laughs> that you know we we can do better we have to do better um, it's, it's too yeah. important to do it like that i'd like yeah. to go back to what you were saying before about you mentioned when you had children you were quite surprised at the uh, very sort of stereotype sexist way in which a lot of the situations with the children were dealt with can I ask what made you learn the importance of fairness and respect for women? What what experiences shaped your awareness in that area? Mm, it's a really, it's a really difficult question. It's a really difficult question, and I'm absolutely aware that I'm in no way a finished article. Or a, oh, none of us are. None of us are. No, no, no. In, in, indeed, I think it's important to say it, though, isn't it? It's important to say that. Um, uh, I, I will feel wrong not to mention that i think i had a very strong ethical model in my mom yeah um still have um and and she's still still around thankfully i'm very lucky um very um i don't know it's, it's strange a very we, we we didn't have a lot of money but we uh, my mom set a lot of store by friendship um which is an interesting model i don't know I, I i i see the value of friendship more than i see the value of acquiring property or money or things like that which isn't specifically a response to why i got involved in this kind of work but i think it's about foregrounding the human above above the inhuman maybe so it kind of um i enjoy friendship i enjoy um solidarity and i perhaps was taught to empathize with people who, who were not as fortunate as us in some ways. And I, I to enjoy laughter and friendship. I know it's a strange response, uh, and but I, it's one that's coming honestly from me. Um, rather, I have read theoretical stuff. I have read Walking. I have read Bell Hooks. I have read Audre Lord. I've, I've read Kimberly Crenshaw. I've read I've read quite a lot, um, but I don't think they instill basic feelings. I think they clarify thinking, um, and they do, and they and they do so brilliantly, as many other you know writers and thinkers have done and do. Um, it sounds like you, you learn to respect people and empathise people, basically people, basically from your mum. Is that what you're saying? I, I would I would certain yeah 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 uh, <laughs> yeah um, it's interesting because I remember when I read Gavin De Becker he says that he he grew up with a mother who was in a partnership with a violent man and he very early learnt to spot the signs of when the violence was going to kick off and he got mm. very very tuned into that and so when mm. he learned later about you know violence as a, a sort of subject out there he was able to relate to that from his own personal experience and see it from the position of a victim, which is maybe not necessarily the easiest, it doesn't come naturally to a lot of men. So it's always interesting to know, uh, you know, how somebody mm. started down that path. I, and when, when think, you were teaching, yeah. what subject did you teach? Oh, uh, ESOL. English is a, a second language. Okay. Uh, yeah, I did that in England and abroad quite a lot That's in FE until the FE classes were all decimated about 10 years ago <laughs> at the stroke virtually. Yeah, I also, I also used to teach uh, Spanish and Italian uh, to adults, um, but mainly ESOL. Um, um, but do, just, do to, just to go back to, my... to get the boys, just going back to that question somebody asked, do you ever have difficulty getting the boys to engage in, in what you're talking about? Um... I get, I get very little refusal. Um, it does happen. Now, it's a, it's a, again, I, I, try to, I try to answer the question. It might seem convoluted, but it does get there in the end. Um, because there are so few things like this, 
when a school engages with it i mean i've worked with some schools for six or seven years now like just just constant new groups uh, which is great and then others that i i start with and i'm, I'm doing a five-week program with some primaries in birmingham at the minute which is brilliant because uh, i'm working with year six boys which is a lovely because they're just like full of full of the joys of spring and ideas and and very receptive but also they haven't learned all the very complex defense mechanisms that 15, 14, 15, 16 year old boys have learned for various reasons. Um, so let me get back to the point that I answer, <laughs> answer your question it properly. It was about uh, struggling to the, get the boys engaged in the issue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the issues that I have is that because there are so few programs like this uh, and the the need is known by most schools. Um, I tend to get the, the boys who have the most um, complex and challenging situations at home or their behavior is more embedded over time, which is not necessarily um, what I would want because I think other people are better to deal with that uh, because there's all kinds of, you know, cognitive development and all kinds of trauma. And I'm not a therapeutic specialist. I, I talk about ideas and I do so with as much solidarity and care as I can. But this is a, that's an indicator of the, the poverty of our national provision and our national imagination that it's, it's like if you were, the only first aider in a town you would end up being asked to operate on people you know if there weren't if there were no doctors so, yeah. so one of the problems is that some of my uh, the, the young men that I've worked with or I do work with have really really difficult shit lives <laughs> uh, just not to put too fine a point on it um, and that in itself can can militate against uh, a conversation going as far and as well as it could because of you know what they're dealing with and what they're having to process and they're very know. disturbed and, and just trying to keep going Ab absolutely so um there's a fragility to that i think that comes sometimes which is it's difficult because the conversation the dialogues are about acknowledging and trying to uh, abandon that fragility but it, even with an hour a week for 10 weeks or whatever it may be you're just scratching the surface of things but i think the important thing is to be seen to be according importance to the subjects that we talk about and that you stand by them and you stand by the need for the conversation and no i don't agree with you when you say that and i will explain why and, and, and just being there and being the man who thinks that and being the man who can hold with the disagreement and deal with a lack of engagement and keep on going and okay this may be a different sort of man than the man you've met in other areas of your life but now mm. you've met one you know there could be others and, and maybe before they hadn't met one uh, yeah yeah i think i think that's it and it's just acknowledging that there should be many more people doing this kind of work and it should be seen as a national priority uh, but it's not so you just turn up and do the best you can. What you can yeah yeah what's the hardest thing to get across you find um i think <laughs> notions of belonging to groups of friends and the hard uh, and the need for friends and the need to belong but the cost that that's a that's a big part of the conversation and the, and the dialogues is at what cost do we uh, maintain friendships the problem the, the other problem is that if if you have um you have a relationship you know with your family like uh, you know that and you respect them and you love them and you have a debt of thanks that you're aware of but the the messages that come explicitly from them run counter to what we talk about in the dialogues mm -hmm. and i think that is a difficult one because you don't want to you don't i don't want to undermine anybody's kind of um loyalty to a family i mean oh, the hell i'm not 
why would I? Although some people do, some of these quack um, lobbyists do, of course. You know, they they want to, they they want to drive a wedge, but I I think that's a vile thing to do. Um, so you just have to be aware that there is conflict in what they hear in the room with what they hear when they go home, and that's a difficult one. But again, if you are steadfast and evidence-based and reasonable then you're making a contribution to their future decision making and they and their can you know, skills and their ability to hold two different opinions in their head at the same time and over yeah. time to maybe move more towards one or to the other which is a, a key skill isn't yeah. it in, a, in any kind of so look, growing up in a society of any kind you have to be able to deal with conflicting views and maybe not resolve them instantly, but over time, start yeah. to form your own opinion from evidence. Yeah, abs absolutely, yeah, that's, that, 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 that's it. Yeah. No, I'm, well, I imagine there must be a, a, a quite a few um, boys who've got religious strictures and, and, you know, a lot of input from the religions that they're a part of in their home life. I am, um, it, it's interesting, in, in, in the geographical area I work, uh, religion isn't a big thing because, it's uh, I, I'm it can, no, I'd say cultural more than religion. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I would say so. Yeah. Um, no, I'm I the the groups of of lads that I've worked with mainly have been mainly secular, mainly white. Not so not. Uh, and never really talked about religion that much. Some of them may have had religions, but have gone to schools which are secular schools. Right. So right. I'm not up against uh, people quoting religious texts to me, whether it's, you know, I, I grew up as a Catholic uh, and I went to a Catholic school. I was an altar boy and, you know, quite a, quite a serious um, upbringing in that sense. I went to a Salesian college where a lot of the teachers were priests. So I've never run up against that. So I'm kind of an, in a secular, uh, on, in, in a rural county. Uh, and I've got one working in Birmingham. Currently, it's a total inverse of that. And, and that's fascinating. And I love it, to be, to be honest. I love that difference. And it's so strange to think it's only 20 miles away. But, um, but I'm aware, after some few sessions there, that religion is a much bigger part of their collective, you know, like cultural identity in a way that is not something I've encountered a great deal here. Although I do work quite a bit with some uh, Gypsy Roma traveller boys oh, yeah. who've got a very distinct um, cultural yeah. outlook. Yeah. Uh, obviously, they're, they're always individuals, but but those are interesting conversations to have. Yes, because I think uh, quite often girls get um, partnered up very young, don't they? Get married very young sometimes in the Roma groups. Yeah, I, be I believe so. I believe so. I, I, it's um, it is a and, and may or may not use public transport, and you know all all kinds of interesting variations that thereof. But yeah, I'm I, I am aware that other people work in much more cosmopolitan, you know, multicultural settings, and, and that is something that in the dialogues, perhaps if anybody wanted to use them, would make more specific because they're fairly uh non-culturally specific so it could well be that to make them more effective people can you know um uh, add, add inflections that are more appropriate to to one group of uh, people or another or a mix of mix of cultures what about issues like surrogacy and the pressure to change your sex does that does that crop up in your groups at all Yeah, everything can, everything can, um, be because we're talking about uh, social norms and, and how they work and pressure and and mental well-being and uh, how we view women, uh, you know, as servants or as providers or as I'm not quite sure who said this. Uh, I watched the TV program. I, I would love. I, love to know to credit this this phrase that we said i'm not your support human oh um, yeah <laughs> no who said it whoever said it yeah, hit the nail on the head yeah. it, it's so so yeah a, a conversation about surrogacy would fit beautifully into that 
Um, it could be about other things as well, but also about about gender. I mean, I don't I don't tell people um, explicitly that, but we don't have explicit conversations about uh, dysphoria. But we do talk about dysphoria because it said in an extreme case, these insane rules that we've got, these abstract, silly kind of cultural things, yeah, can make. Yeah, can make can make you utterly, utterly miserable, so, and, and it could play out in a, all kinds of ways. You know, we talk about uh, mental health and about um, suicide, self harm, uh, substance abuse, risk taking, and we talk, uh, and it, we are talking about gender as opposed to sex because we uh, gender is the the object of the whole thing. It's is that's what we're talking about. It's about the social construction and the collective socialization yeah. uh, through gender of male and female human beings and and the mess that that wreaks upon us uh, and and the multiple ways that we respond to it and and so yeah we we do and we don't talk about that if that makes sense so yeah. it's not like yeah. right it's Tuesday we're going to talk about uh, people who you know identify as, as the other sex it's more like gender's messed up it messes us up let's talk about the ways it messes us up and that can just be a free-flowing conversation in, in in the chat has made quite a good point about it so she calls it political dysphoria instead of gender dysphoria because in a way that's what it is it's what our society yeah. our polis pushes on us isn't it for sure yeah 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 it's it's um yeah, well, it's it's a harm done by society on individuals, and some respond in different ways. But I mean, that that's why I completely reject the the non the notion of cisgender. Yeah. Um. I must confess, I've never had the conversation about cisgender. I explained this with with the boys because there's so much other shit to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's but just I, controlling in a but, way. Yeah, but 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 you know, if somebody mentions it, I'll talk about it. You know, it's um, but the cisgender thing is um, it, it's a non-starter basically because the, there are no humans who are fully harmonious with the gender expectations placed on them by culture, and that is the definition offered by uh, the proponents of the notion of cisgenderism. Uh, if if there were I think there would be remarkably strange people. They would basically be G.I. Joe and Barbie. They wouldn't be human beings because no, no sentient person can feel fully happy and relaxed and at ease with the stuff that is given to us to be as a man or a woman. And also that they're so culturally and historically specific and shift yeah, there's, li yeah. there's literally no logic to it, and I'd be quite happy to just you know explain that to anybody <laughs> who who um, who in class wanted to. They do occasionally. They talk. They refer to it like it's it's more of a a, a joke in a sense, in that they say, um, "Oh, I'm identifying as a girl today," or whatever it might be. You know, yeah. bec because that whole discourse offers so much potential for that. Yeah. because it is so not rooted in logic then of course kids are going to play with it of course yeah. i mean i would i would have I'd have, I would too, yeah. you know, I'd have gone to town with it there's no doubt um but the that notion of gender not being a, a correct fit for anybody is is basically there, there is no such thing as cisgender it's, it's a, there's a word cisgender but there's not a there's not it doesn't denote anything concrete or real. Meaningful, no, no, absolutely. Um, how do you fight the current cancel culture and get people to listen to two sides of an argument? Have you ever been cancelled mm. by anybody? Um, yeah, I've, I've um, a few times a few times um, because I don't pull any punches um, on Twitter. I I I I, I see. Mm, Male violence is something I'd like to I'd like to contribute towards uh, illuminating and perhaps delegitimizing. You know that's a very simple thing, and so I won't I won't not talk about some aspects of it just just because I think I might get a few more gigs in schools. Um, 
because at the end of the day, you might die. I might die tomorrow, and I don't want to die doing something which I think is dishonest. Um, so yeah, I do talk about um, you know the, the the whole. I support groups like you know Women's Place UK, Fair Play for Women, uh, yourselves, um, because I, I I agree with what you're saying, and I think I'd like to amplify your voice. Uh, and yeah, occasionally I think I have lost a few uh, engagements because of that you know that engagement in um the the dispute about women's rights being sacrificed by the embrace of um, a very uh, incoherent uh, ideology based around gender identity but um but okay i'm not starving um it, it's a lot worse for a lot of other people and basically i just want to be consistent and i i can't i can't not do um uh, it all to that. you can't not say it can you you can't not call yeah. it out what it is yeah. no. the harm that's being done to a lot of uh, people no that's absolutely true. absolutely what, I mean, queer yeah. theory? what do you think about queer theory michael um Very popular. Ken, yeah it was yeah well it would be wouldn't it because it's so it's so patriarchy friendly yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah no i um with it with any theory basically th theories are fine you know theories great you know it, you know expect expend energy having a theory terrific you know do some mental weightlifting if, if, uh, and, and enjoy it um keep policy separate just keep it just keep it separate you know go to san francisco go to judith butler le uh, lecture do what you want enjoy uh never get involved in safeguarding never get involved in public health never get involved in the law so i don't know i might be fair Hopefully, uh, well, I, I, I don't agree with you, whether you've been fair or not. A theory, yeah, theory I... is, is good, in, good until the next theory comes along. And as far as I can see, queer theory turned all the previous stuff on its head and then looked at it yeah. and found it was exactly the same as it was before. Yeah, absolutely. It offers no challenge to male violence. Um, it, it, in fact, it, it facilitates it by um, dissolving the language that we need to talk about it. Yeah. So, so I, I, I am antipathetic to it. I, I, I get it, I've read it, I studied it, I did quite a lot of it at Masters 20 years ago. Um, never occurred to me that I would be seeing its proponents actually involved in running kids' charities or, you know, advising government or advising, um, you know, the NHS. That, that would have, <laughs> I, th I think I would have just th thought somebody was having a laugh if that yeah. was a prediction but th that's where we are the people who studied um you know at brighton or sussex uni or leeds or wherever it may be now are actually getting jobs as civil servants uh, and that fight is very much on and i support people who um who speak out against it because i think it's it's uh i think it's patriarchy friendly it's, gi it's gibberish it's illogical uh think it if you like read it you know, go to lectures, it's all fab, but just just don't work in anything that has real world impact. I'd agree with you. What, have you ever had a particularly difficult boy? One that you really felt you weren't getting anywhere with? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, for sure. Um, and did you ever get any insight into that later maybe? or? Did did you learn from it? No, I, I um, yeah, it, it makes me, uh, I, I, I sense the deficit in myself really. Um, that I think, I think that's the, the right approach is that I think it's the way that the boys arrive in the room is a, is a tricky one because they are put there because they are either very problematic in school with their behavior or or are perceived to be problematic, um, or that they're very, very vulnerable. So, as I, as I said, I, th I think my work would, would be better in a more mainstream setting yeah. Beca yeah. because I feel frustrated at my lack of ability on, on occasion to really reach out and give the young man or oh boy what they they really need but it's beyond my capacity in, the sense you, in that case you've been set up haven't you because for some of the boys they will see this is maybe punishment or they're being perceived as in they're needing this as top up because they're inadequate 
and that's yeah. not, whereas actually this is something that all boys should be getting oh, ab it's absolutely a, is it, you know, a lot of we know all those super normal boys out there oh boys will be boys it's fine yeah, yeah, yeah. They, yeah. they will need it too so in a sense you're starting from three paces further back aren't you when you when they're all set yeah 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 there is there is that that is a fact because of the scarcity of, of supply if you like you know um of this kind of work you tend to get like a funnel uh, or a, a top red priority list of and, and it's schools who really want to support them and, and they look around they don't know what to do they don't know where to go they don't know who to ask and, and so they're operating with the best of intentions it's just that we're up we are collectively operating in a very um, dysfunctional national culture that is marked by a lack of what there should be so i do what i can in the situations that i'm given um but want there to be many many more programs like this so that we can link up and help each other and amplify each other's voices and get kind of proper governmental support because uh, you know governments that commit to you know tackling domestic abuse or coercive control or whatever it may be it, that's so easy to do it's so easy to say it i mean and, and then as they did last week you know vote against things like keep it you know register of stalkers and you know just completely um not matching their words with actions and the end well, counting isn't it if you're having a ready you're just counting the people who are stalking you know it's basically yeah, yeah. Things. they're not stalking all the time you know no people are gonna sometimes they're a stalker and sometimes they're not it's, it's counting something instead of dealing with something isn't it yeah yeah they they, they um they, we we need we need a political will that's what's missing fundamentally there is no political will because it's not something that is affecting people in in positions of power mainly you know yeah poor um and 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 therefore this this work i see it as part of uh, you know a constellation of other kinds of campaigns like your own obviously um against prostitution against porn against um stalking against street harassment sexual harassment in work because it all boils down to the same thing about the, the mismatch the disparity in power between male and female human beings um and and which is why i don't think that it is in any way helpful just to start t tinkering with the nomenclature of what man and woman means it's just a complete cul-de-sac and in fact uh, more uh, does more harm than good uh, it might it, some individuals might feel personally liberated by it but you know personal liberation is like getting an escape pod from a doomed planet well done <laughs> but we're all stuck here what we're going to yeah. do now exactly yeah it's, we're coming to the end of our time now and uh, i've got some um, a gentleman who's been waiting for quite a while for an answer to his question i've got an answer to him it's a guy i call philip he says how can a man make amends for participating in structures of sexual exploitation and domination and I would say, first of all, do something about it. Join an organisation, do something. Second of all, you spend a whole lifetime being paid an awful lot more than a woman for doing a, a, an equivalent kind of work. Put your hand in your pocket and make a very, very substantial, regular donation to a feminist cause that will make the world a better place. So that's what I would say to you, Philip. Is there anything you would like to add to Philip, Michael? No, that's spot on. But, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, you've had your realisation. Good. Um, support people who are fighting the things that you now realise are bad. And, um, and just challenge other men when they come out with this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, tell people that you're doing it. Not 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 for medals, but just so that they can see that there are, there are men who have learned and are wanting to, you know, uh, make amends, whether it's, you know, something you, you feel like that is the right word for yourself or to to do the right thing. Yeah, and, and, and almost all groups that are doing the right thing are underfunded <laughs> and that yeah. is its own historical tale. So yeah, support, support women only shelters, support campaigns, do, do, do something. Yeah, I would agree, thank you very much. And we have now in the news this weekend, got somebody called Justin Baldini, a young man who, is calling out the toxicity of male culture. So, you know, few and far between, but there are a few and we hope there will be a lot more. And um, I'm mm. sure some of the young men that you've dealt with will have gone down a slightly different path and, and may mature into the kind of man that can 
make the change rather than uh, you know go with the flow. That's it. That's it. It's, yeah, that's that's the whole. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. It's been very interesting talking to you. Thank no, you. Uh, in the next time, we've got Heather Brunskill Evans talking about her new article about transgenderism. And of course, we'll be discussing the uh, recent judgment at the Tavistock, whereby they've decided that if parents agree a 16 year old can have hormones after all, I think it's an invitation to all the homophobic parents to get their children uh, conversion therapy. But we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks with Heather. So hope you'll be able to join us then. Thanks again very much, Michael. Thanks very much for joining us. Bye bye, everybody. Really good to see you. Did we do well, my darling girls? Did we really do well? We grew you up to be straight and strong To do your best to know right from wrong But we grew you in this awful world A world that's hard and tough for girls And part of your strength was to take it To take it and make it okay but it's not okay, my darling girls, in this fucked up, muddled up, mixed up world.